Hi there, and welcome to the API testing with Postman course. My name is Valentine, I'm a software developer, and I like to share my passion for APIs with others in a way that is easy to understand. When I'm not speaking at a conference or traveling the world, I like to share what I know by creating short tutorials and online courses like this one. In this course, you will understand what Postman is and why do we need this tool. Start using Postman to interact with APIs and write API tests. In the last part of the course, we'll explore ways to automate the entire testing process. You will get hands-on experience using an API. Throughout the course, I'll give you assignments as a way to practice what you have learned. If you are serious about API testing, you need to practice on your own. Make sure you check the video description for the course notes. I'll be putting there the most important steps. You need to take links to resources, any updates, just in case something has changed. So let's get started. Before we get our hands dirty, let's make sure we understand the basics. If you're new to APIs, here is a very quick introduction. An API is essentially an interface to a server that has some data or does some actions. To understand the concept of an interface, think about any power outlet you have in your home. It does not matter which device you want to power, your laptop, a washing machine, or a TV. The outlet on the wall is designed to accept any plug following a predefined specification. An interface is essentially a contract. I live here in Europe, so all sockets have a specific form. If I bring a device from the United States or Australia, this will not work as they have a different interface. The APIs we are dealing with share a similar concept. To use an API, we need to know and follow the specification. If you are totally new to APIs, I do recommend watching another course here at Free Code Camp created by Craig Dennis to get the basics of APIs right. I think the best way to understand APIs is by actually using them. Let's get back to Postman. Postman is a tool for interacting with web-based APIs, that is, APIs that work over the internet. An API is like an outlet that a server offers, and instead of electricity, we get data. We use Postman to plug into this outlet, but instead of using a physical cable, we use the internet. Postman can help us connect to that API and make sure that the process of sending and receiving data is much easier. Without that interface to the server, it would be much harder to communicate. So this is why we need Postman. In this lesson, we'll learn how to install Postman. Postman uses a freemium pricing model, and for many use cases, including this course, it is free to use. There are two ways of running Postman. In your browser, by going to postman.com, or as a standalone app that you have to download and install. There is also an old and deprecated Google Chrome extension. Don't use that one. I'll be using the browser application throughout this tutorial, but the app's functionality is very similar. You will find installation instructions in the course notes. I'll go to postman.com and sign up for an account. The setup after this is relatively easy and I will not create a team yet. This is it. Postman is actively developed. By the time I have finished recording, editing, and publishing this course, a new version will be released. You may notice slight differences from what you see right now in this video. However, I can reassure you that the principles stay the same. I will update the course notes if there's something really important you need to know. The first thing that I like to do when opening Postman for the first time is changing to the black theme. So in order to do that, simply locate this gear icon. This will take us to the settings. And from the tab with themes, I'll select the black theme and simply close this. So let's go ahead and start using an API in Postman. For this course, we'll be using an API that allows us to order a book. Now, every time we want to start using an API, 
we need to understand how to interact with that API. And the best way to start is always by looking at the API documentation. Now, any API out there that you want to use should have an API documentation that explains you how to use that API, explains what's available and so on. The API that we'll be using allows us to have a look at a list of books and to order a book. So right from the API documentation that you see here, and that will be linked in the course notes, you'll be able to see that the API is available at this specific address. And additionally, there are some endpoints that we can use. Endpoints offer different kind of responses, and we're going to take a look at them. The first endpoint that we should look into is the status endpoint. So what I'm going to do is simply copy the address of the API. And here inside Postman, from the workspaces, I will select my workspace. Workspaces in Postman allow you to organize your work better. Let me make this a bit bigger. So I'm going to go ahead and open up a new tab. And this looks pretty much similar to what you have in a browser. It's just a bit more advanced. I'm going to paste here the address. And after it, I'm going to write status. All requests that will go to this API must include this address here. I'm going to hit here the send button. And what I'm going to get back is in the lower part of the screen. I'm going to say status OK. So this is our first request in Postman. We have sent a request to this API, to this status endpoint. And essentially, the status endpoint is just telling us that the API is available, is working as expected, and that we can start using it. Next, let's take a closer look at what has happened here. You can load this here in the address that we are using this HTTPS protocol. HTTPS stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol, HTTP, and the S means secure, so it's a secure connection. Most APIs should be using HTTPS, but for the purpose of what I'm going to demonstrate next, HTTP and HTTPS are essentially the same thing. Now, just to do a bit of HTTP recap. In our communication between the client and the server, now in this case, the client is Postman and the server or the API is this simple books API, we are using HTTP messages. The HTTP message that goes from Postman to the API is called the request and what is coming back from the API is the response. The request in Postman is represented here on the upper part. And essentially, Postman allows you to configure many things about the request. The request will contain the URL or the address where you're sending this request. In this case, we have this is the address of the API and this is the endpoint, but we are specifying everything in one address. We also have the request method and we'll get into that a bit later. We can specify headers and Postman has been kind enough and already added a few headers for us. And we're going to take a look at those headers a bit later. And we also can specify a body, which for a GET request, we don't need to do that. We'll never do it for a GET request because with a GET request, we're just trying to get data. We're not sending any data. But for example, with a POST request, we will specify a body. Now, this is essentially what is happening with a request. So again, just to quickly recap, Postman allows us to configure the different properties of the HTTP request. On the lower part of the screen here, this is the response. And the response also contains some properties. You will find the status code, in this case, 200. The response will also contain some headers and generally both for the request and the response, the headers are like some meta information, some additional information that goes with the message. It's not always necessary to have this, but it just makes the communication a bit easier. 
Just to give you an example here, what's coming back here is a header called content type. And it's telling essentially Postman that, hey, what we have received here is represented as JSON. You'll see here application slash JSON. And using this information, Postman can look at the response body and say, oh, I know this is JSON, so I'm going to display it as JSON instead of using, for example, text, which you can see doesn't look so nice. So these are like some additional things that travel both with the request and the response. The response will also contain what is probably the most interesting and most important part, the response body. Essentially, the response body contains the entire response. Whatever we wanted to get as an information from the server will be available in the response body. I'm going to point out the different parts of the HTTP request message and HTTP response message throughout the course. But I just wanted to do a short recap of what's available and where we can find this information inside Postman. Now, let's say that we want to keep this request. We already have configured here the API address and let's say we want to reuse it at a later point. So what we can do here is click on the save button inside Postman. And we can also give this request a name. For example, we can call it API status. And we cannot simply save this request as it is. We'll see here that this save button is disabled. We have to create a collection. A collection is essentially a list of multiple requests. Typically, they are all connected to the same API. So if you're working with multiple APIs, probably will have a collection for each individual API or sometimes even for the same API, depending on the use cases. So I'm going to go ahead here, click on Create Collection, and I'm going to call it Simple Book API. Click here on this check mark, and now this request will be saved in this collection. If I go ahead and close the tab, we'll be able to find here in this part here of Collections, We'll see here the collection itself. And if I click on one of the requests inside the collection, the tab will automatically open up and I can run that request again. Typically in Postman, we try to avoid having addresses or configuration in our requests just in case something changes. So I'm going to go ahead, select this address here. And you will see here that Postman offers this set as a variable. So essentially we can replace this with a variable that we can configure in a single place. So let me show you what I mean by that. I'm gonna click here on set as variable. I'm gonna select here set as a new variable. I'm gonna call it base URL because this is the URL where all our requests will go and we'll just use different endpoints. The value that will be saved is available here and should not include the final slash. We also have to select the scope. Now there are different scopes available in Postman where we can save this variable. I'm going to get into those a bit later. For this example, we're going to select the collection scope. So essentially this variable will be saved in the collection. And that's about it. I can go ahead and save this request again. And you will see here, if I hover over this variable that has this very special syntax here with double curly braces in the beginning and two double curly braces at the end, you will also see the value that this has. If you want to change this variable, all we have to do is to hover over the collection name here. These three dots will show up. I'm going to select here edit and from the variables tab you'll be able to see here the base URL variable. Just in case this set variable option doesn't appear when you select the address don't worry about it you can simply go ahead and manually add the variable here. For any variables in Postman you will notice the initial value and the current value. The initial value is something that will be shared with other people. For example, if you share this collection with someone else, someone in your organization, a friend of yours, or 
anyone, they will be able to see the initial value. And this is fine for this API because this is a public API. The address is known, so there's no secret there. Later on, we'll be using some secrets and we may not want to share them with others. And we're going to keep them in the current value. So you can keep in mind like the current value is what is being used in Postman. And this is private to you. The initial value is something that is not being used when you're sending a request and uh, will be shared with others. So if we go ahead and run this request again, we'll see that there's absolutely no difference. So Postman will replace this variable with the address and will send this request just as before. It is just much nicer for us to have it all in one place. All right, let's go back to using this API. So far, the status endpoint hasn't been very exciting. So let's take a look at the next endpoint. And this is the slash books endpoint. This will give us a list of books. So in Postman, what we can do is to select the address that we already have here, open up a new tab, paste the address here, because this request is not in a collection, you will see here that the base URL doesn't get resolved. It would say here unresolved variable because the variable is only in a collection and this current request that we have here, this tab is not saved in that collection. So we're gonna go ahead and click here on save. The simple books API is already selected, but just in case you don't see it here or you have multiple collections to select from, simply select the respective collection where we want to save the request. And I'm going to call this list of books. And we're going to also change this to books. So if you're looking here at the API, you'll see that we need to submit a get request to the slash books endpoint. So we have here get, get is always by default. We have here the base URL slash books. So let's go ahead and click that send button and see what happens. Again, on the lower part of the screen, we'll see the response. What's important to notice here is that we get a status 200. A status 200 always indicates that a request was understood and that essentially everything was okay. So when you see 200 okay, this means that everything is fine. And you will see here that we have a list of different books. What you see here, this way of formatting data, this is called JSON. And it is very easy to get this information that is essentially just a text and to parse it and use it in essentially any programming language out there. So it makes this data very portable from one system to the other. Going back to the API documentation, we'll also notice that there are some optional query parameters. And this is what we wanted to take a look in this lecture. So what are query parameters? Well, query parameters are some additional data that we can submit with our request. For some APIs, they are mandatory. And for some APIs, they are optional. In this case, these query parameters are optional. So let me give you an example. We can add here in Postman under query parameters. You will see here we have params selected. And right below that we have query params. So we can write something like type. And let's say we are searching for a crime book. So I'm going to write here the value crime. You can notice as I type here, the address itself has changed as well. And you can notice in an address query parameters at a point where you see a question mark and after that you will see something like a key value pair. So the key is type, then we have the equal sign and then we have a value. In this case, I expect that this will help us filter through all these books and only get the books that are crime books. Now this time something different appears here. You will see first of all that the status has turned from a status 200 into a status 400 bad request. When you see a status 400, 
it generally means that you have done something wrong. So the API has understood your request, but whatever you have sent is not correct. And most of the time you will see additional information in the response body. And it says here, and it's very important that you read these errors. Sometimes they are a bit technical and maybe confusing in the beginning, but you just have to bear with these errors and try to understand what's going on. So here it will say invalid value for query parameter type. The query parameter type is what we're trying to send here, this type. And it says here must be one of fiction or nonfiction. So essentially the response is telling us, hey, you have sent here something that I didn't expect. This is not valid. We only accept fiction and nonfiction. There is no crime type or something like that. So if I select here fiction and replace crime with fiction, you will see also the address here has changed. Then I will get back the list of only fiction books. And you can even see here that everywhere it says fiction, fiction, there is no longer non-fiction. Now these query parameters tend to be a bit confusing in the beginning because it seems quite arbitrary, like why should they be called type or why does it work this way? And the thing is, there is no rule. Which query parameters are available can only be known by reading the API documentation. We can add parameters, for example, I can invent the parameters like foo and we give here the value bar and notice here how the address has changed. Now we have this end sign between the pairs. So this is how you can send multiple query parameters pairs with your request. But essentially nothing has changed. So we can send data to the API, but it doesn't mean that the API will look for this data and will do anything to change it. So this is why it's important to look into the API documentation. Here is documented. They are optional, so these are not required. There are two optional query parameters. One is type and one is the limit. Additionally, with query parameters in Postman, what you can do is to simply click on this checkbox. And if you unclick it, you will see that query parameter disappears from the address. And if at one point you decide that you don't need that query parameter anymore, you can simply hover over it. And you should notice here this X. You can click on it. This will delete that query parameter. Okay, time for an assignment. Now you have to go and study the API documentation and use the limit query parameter and add that to your request. And I also encourage you to try out the different values. I'm going to give you a few moments to pause the video and to try this on your own. Okay, so let me show you how I would solve this assignment. First of all, it's always important to go back to the documentation to understand what's going on. It's also important that whenever you're using a query parameter, that you use it exactly as it's being stated in the documentation. What I like typically to do is to simply copy the name so that I don't enter anything that's wrong, make any mistakes in spelling that specific parameter, whatever that is. And we'll say here that it must be a number between 1 and 20. So let's try to understand what this does. I'm going to simply paste it here so you can see it, it has been added. It doesn't have any value yet. And let's say I'm going to write here limit 2. And what I expect this to do is to only give us two results back. You will see here now we have four books that are coming back. And now with limit two, we only get two books back. That's great. Now, if I try something else, like for example, 25, I'll get here a bad request. Now, again, we have sent something to the API and the API doesn't allow this. So it says here, you cannot get more than 20 books in one request for, for example, performance reason. So we have to adapt this to something that is being accepted by the API. So we can see back two has been valid. I was saying earlier that it's so easy to write something different. So for example, if I write limit with a capital L, I will not get back only two results. There will be more results. So essentially we can say that 
limit with a capital L and limit written all in lowercase, they are two different query parameters. And the API is only recognizing one of them and totally ignoring the other one. It is like writing here foo and with a value two. Makes no difference. Let's continue exploring this API. We now have a list of books, but as you can see, there's not really a lot of information about each book. And the reason for that is because this view here where we see a list of books is a simplified view. If you take a look at the documentation here, the next endpoint that we can use is to get a single book. And this time the path will look a bit different. So we're gonna copy this path here. Open up a new tab, paste it here. And of course, we also have to use the base URL. So the first step is simply saving it in the collection to get single book. This is how I'm gonna call this. And as soon as the request is inside a collection, I can use the syntax with double curly braces. So double curly braces. And the variable that we're trying to use is base URL. And this has been detected. You're probably wondering what is with this book ID here in the address? This is what we call a path parameter or a path variable, because as the name variable implies, it changes all the time. This endpoint allows us to specify a value for this path variable which represents one of the books that we are trying to get additional information on. We look back at the list of books, you will see here that each book has an ID. You will see here ID 1, ID 3, ID 4, ID 6, and so on. So let's go ahead and edit here the path variable book ID and put in the variable 1. And just a few seconds later, we now have only one book that we're getting. So this endpoint allows us to get a single book, but we now get a more detailed information. We can see the ID and the name. We already knew that, but we now see information about the author, book code, the price of the book, how many books are in stock and so on. So this is the purpose of this endpoint to give us detailed information. Instead of having here a list of books, which contain really a lot, a lot of information, we can get that specific information from this specific API. We just need to know the book ID. If we enter here a book ID that doesn't exist, for example, 100, what it will get back is 404 not found. You probably know 404 not found from browsing the internet. When you end up at a page that doesn't exist anymore, the same principle applies to APIs. In this case, we're trying to get the book with ID 100 and the API is telling us, hey, there is no book with ID 100. This will always be reflected also in the error itself. What is interesting about the path variables is that they are different from the query parameters that we have used before. First of all, you will notice here there is no question mark. Apart from this, this book ID key, this is not something that will be sent. So to make it even more explicit, this is what will be sent. You will have the base URL slash books slash one. Postman will replace that path parameter with a value. We see it here in the editor just a bit nicer. It's easier for us to see that. And one here will be part of the path. Just as books is part of the path, but books is always there, books doesn't change. But here we can have ID one, we can have ID two, we can have ID four and so on. This is why we prefer the syntax where we specify here the book ID. How we call this, we can call it book ID, we can simply call it ID. It doesn't really matter because as I mentioned, the key itself compared to the query parameters will not be sent. It's also possible to use both query parameters and path parameters. There's nothing preventing you from adding a query parameter called foo with a value bar. But this is something that the API needs to accept. As in the query parameters, 
If you're just sending some random data, the API will totally ignore it. So let's remove this query parameter and save the request. Let's say we have identified a book that we want to order. So what would be the next step? Again, we have to jump back to documentation and to understand how to submit an order. You can now see that the endpoint that we need to use is orders, but this time also the HTTP request method, we're no longer getting data, with post we are sending data. So we need to create a post request with Postman. I'm gonna copy this endpoint and go through the same process once again. If creating this request manually is too time consuming, you can also go here to your collection to an existing request, click on the three dots and click on duplicate. We'll create a copy of that request where we already have this request being saved. So all we have to do is to enter the new path and we can also change the name. So for example, here we're gonna name this request order book. As you remember, we cannot longer use a get request. If we try a get request, this will not work. We have to select a post request. Now, as you remember with a post request, we have to supply a body. So if we go here to the body, you will see that we don't have a body. But we're anyway missing something for this, so I'm gonna simply click on send and see what happens. Now this time, we're gonna get a 401 unauthorized. And it says here in the error, missing authorization header. When working with APIs, some endpoints, as for example, status or this books endpoints, they were public and required no authentication. Essentially, anyone can use them. Other endpoints, for example, this one where we're trying to essentially create something, create an order, they can be private and require authentication. This is totally up to the API provider. There is no hard rule telling you that, you know, for this case, you need authentication, for others, you don't need. For some APIs, they are totally public, but especially if you're trying to create data, most of the time you will have to deal with some sort of an application. If you look here at the API, it will also say here that it requires authentication. So in order to figure out how to deal with this, we have to look into the part of how to get this authentication working. So if we scroll further down the page, we'll see this part with API authentication. It says here to submit or view an order, you need to register your API client. An API client is in our case Postman. The client server communication is what we're doing. We are the client, we're sending HTTP messages to the server and the server is responding. What it essentially means is that we need to register ourselves with the API. And it is a way for the API to identify who's sending this request and who's creating the data, if there's any data that has been created. There are many authentication methods when it comes to APIs and it is impossible to go into all of them. I'm just going to explain to you a very typical use case that you may encounter essentially with any public API that you're trying to use. The purpose of this registration is to obtain what is known as an access token. An access token is like a temporary password that you're getting. And you can use that password with all your requests. And in this way, you're authenticating yourself. Don't worry if it doesn't make sense right now. We'll get to it in a second. So this time we need to submit another post request. And this post request has to go to this endpoint, API-clients. And it also needs to include the following JSON body. And here's an example. So again, I'm gonna Simply go ahead and save this order book. I'm gonna duplicate it. Let's call it register API client. And endpoint will be slash API clients. You can add a final forward slash or not. For most APIs, it will not make any difference. 
as you recall, we have to select here the post HTTP request method because the post will allow us to submit a request body. I'm gonna click here on body and instead of none, which essentially means doesn't send any data with a request, in order to submit a JSON request body, we have to select here raw. And from the drop down that you see here, we're gonna select JSON. Let's jump back to the API documentation. And luckily here, we also get an example in regards to how this request body should look like. So I'm gonna simply go ahead and copy this example here. And I'm gonna paste it here. So essentially what we're sending here is we're giving ourselves a name and we're also specifying our email address. It's very important that when you're submitting JSON to ensure that this JSON is valid. For example, if I don't put these values between double quotes, or if I forget one of these double quotes here, something red will show up. Essentially, if you see something red when you're trying to submit JSON, it's not a good sign and you should go ahead and fix it. In this case, everything looks well, so I'm gonna click on send. This time we get a different status code, and this one is 201 created. 201 created is pretty similar with 200, which means, okay, everything that starts with two something is typically a good sign, it means that everything was okay. Everything which starts with four indicates that there was something wrong with the request that we have submitted. And if there's anything like 500, it typically indicates a server issue or some other problem. So now we have submitted our name and our email, and we got back an access token. This is the password that we can use in the upcoming request. So I'm gonna simply double click on it, copy it, go to our collection, click on edit, open here the variables, close this documentation here. I'm gonna write here access token. Now the initial value is something that I don't want to provide. Just in case I'm sharing this with anyone, this is my token, I don't wanna share it with anyone else. So I'm not adding it to the initial value. Current value is what is being used by Postman inside this installation. I want to make sure that this access token is saved because if I try to submit this request once again with the exact same data, I'll get back the error API client already registered. And you will see here that we get another status code 409 conflict. So it indicates that something went wrong, essentially this API client has already been registered. So make sure that you use another email address. It doesn't have to be a real email address for this API. Now we have this token, so we can close this request. And let's go back to our post request. Now, as you remember here, it says missing authorization header. So we have to go back to this header thing that we kind of avoided so far. When working with APIs, you will not be provided with a form where you can add your username and password. So we always need to somehow send this information with our request, especially where authentication is necessary. Typically, you will add this authentication information to the headers. Some APIs allow you to add them as query parameters. Some of them allow you to add them in the body, but it's quite common to add them to the headers. Now there are already a few headers here that Postman has added for us, and we can take a quick look at them. Essentially, one of the most important ones is user agent, which essentially identifies who's making the requests. It's also telling like which kind of responses are accepted and so on. And here we have to add this authorization header. Now we don't want to get too technical right now. And Postman is known for making things a bit easier for us. There is this authorization tab here, and if I click on it, you will see here that we have different types of, let's say, authorization helper that we can use. Now, I know the list is a bit long and I won't be able to get into each of them, but essentially what we have here is a token. So we're gonna select the beer token, and you'll see here a simple form where you can simply add your token. Now, we don't want to add our token here, 
we will use our variable. So again, using the syntax access token, we're going to select it. And you will see here it's available. So double curly brace in the beginning, then exactly the name of the variable as you had it. And if this request is saved in the collection and you hover over it, you should be able to see the value. All right, perfect. Now, if you come back to the headers, you will see here that Postman has auto-generated one header that is called authorization, exactly the header that we're missing. And it has a value in a very specific way. This beer token authorization must include the word beer, then a space, and then essentially the token. So that's about it. Instead of manually doing this, and you can definitely do that manually as well, we can use this authorization helper in Postman and Postman will take care of it. It's absolutely the same thing. Just wanted to show you like what's happening from a technical point of view. All right. Let's hit this send button once again and see what's happening. Now this time we're not getting a 401. We're still getting a 4 something. We're getting 400 bad requests. And it's just telling us invalid or missing book ID. So we're trying to submit an order. We haven't specified anything, but we'll fix that a bit later. All right, so let's go back to submitting this order. We wanted to order a book and we have to tell this API which book we want. So if we go here to body and select, for example, raw and say something like we want book with ID one and submit this request. I'm afraid the API will not understand what we mean by this. So again, we have to look at the API documentation to try to understand how to do this, how to submit this information, how to specify what we want. So in this case, in order to submit an order, you'll see here an example. And again, we have to submit a request body in a JSON format and include these properties. And luckily, again, we have here an example that we can simply go ahead and copy. So I'm going to totally replace this with this JSON here. And I want you to take a moment to talk about JSON, because I know a lot of people just getting started with JSON sometimes have issues. And the most common issue is generating invalid JSON. Postman, as I mentioned before, tries to take care and help you out if you make any mistakes. Still, it's kind of important to understand what a JSON is. Now, JSON is essentially just a key value way of sending data. So for example, here, the key is book ID and the value is one. And again, we have a comma here separating this, let's say values that we're sending key value pairs. And the next key value pair is the customer name and it has the value John. If we try to write something different, instead of this column, we are adding here an equal sign. This is not valid. So it has to match the syntax of what JSON is essentially from a specification point of view. We have these quotes here. So if you specify one of the keys without using the quotes, this is again, not valid JSON. So we need to specify these quotes. They also have to be double quotes. They cannot be single quotes. There's one exception to these quotes, and you probably already see it here. One is not between quotes, and you may be wondering, why is that? Well, the truth is, we're using quotes when we're sending strings. The reality is that we are sending a lot of strings. For example, John is a string. If we have an address, that's a string as well. But one here is a number we can also have a Boolean. For example, if we specify something like true or false, that is also fine. So there are a few exceptions. And if we put, for example, one between two double quotes, this would be valid JSON, but this will no longer be, technically speaking, a number. It will be a string. All right. So just keep in mind that you need to submit valid information to the API. If you're submitting an invalid JSON, well, that API will not be able to understand what you mean. And let me give you an example. I'm removing this comma here. You will see here Postman is trying to warn you. You don't care about it. 
still go ahead and you're getting something back like, this is not processable. I cannot work with this. This is what the API is telling you. So always pay attention. Make sure that you understand what Postman is trying to tell you. Make sure that the JSON that you're sending is valid. So welcome to the next assignment. And in this assignment, you have to create this post request, which should be already done by now. Submit it and see what's happening. Additionally, I want you to see and identify a book inside a collection of books that has a stock of zero. So essentially it's not in stock. And try ordering that book as well and see what's happening. I'm going to give you a few seconds to pause the video and to do the assignment on your own. And I highly encourage you to practice this. All right, so let me show you how I would solve this assignment. Essentially, we should have a valid JSON here. So if we go ahead and hit the send button, what we're getting back here is a status 201 created. So we have successfully created this order. It even says here in the response, created true. And we're getting back an order right here. And that's totally fine. So it means that we have submitted an order now and this order will be processed. Of course, the order that we send here is very simple. It doesn't include an address, phone number, and so on. So it's not 100% realistic, but the idea remains the same. Now, what's happening if we're trying to submit an order for a book that is no longer available? First of all, how do we find this book? Well, we have to go back to the list of books here. And you can see here with the filters that we already have, all of them are available. I'm gonna remove the foo here. And you will be able to see here that the book with ID two says here available false. So let's take a look inside that book to see what's happening. So I'm gonna go to the get single book endpoint and specify a book ID two. And you will see here that the current stock is zero. So I'm wondering what's going to happen if we try to order this book. And we're going to get back a 404 not found. I'm going to say this book is not in stock. Try again later. So this is the assignment. When we're trying to test APIs and especially when we need to send data, we have a tendency of reusing essentially the same data over and over again. And most of the time, this will prevent us from identifying issues with the API, especially if we've been asked to test and ensure that that API will work properly. In this case, there are not so many things that can go wrong. We already tested what's happening with the book ID that is in stock and another one that's not in stock. You can also try and play out with different values. But how about if we get some support from Postman in trying out different values? And for example, here for the customer name, how about you know, generating a random customer name so that we don't send all the requests with John? Well, fortunately, there is a functionality hidden in Postman that allows us to send random data with our requests. And that is a special kind of variable. It's called a random variable. So I'm gonna remove John here, but make sure that I keep the double quotes because if we're trying to send a string without double quotes, you know it, it's not gonna be valid JSON. So I'm gonna open here two double curly braces and the dollar sign. And as soon as I do this, you will see here a huge list of variables that are available. Now I'm not gonna go through all of them. I'm gonna write here random. And let's say we want a random full name. All right, so let's click here on send. And again, we're going to get the error that the book is not in stock. So let's try a different one. And now again, a new request has been sent. The problem now is we're sending something, but we have no idea what we have sent. Fortunately, Postman has another neat functionality, and that is the Postman console. It is a bit technical and a bit geeky, but it is important to use it as one of the most important tools when you're using Postman. You can find the postman here right at the bottom of the screen, should say console, and it will open up inside postman. 
Typically, you should already have like a long list of things here that we don't need at this point. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to click here on clear. Let's submit this request once again. And now this time we'll see here the post request going out with a full address at the orders endpoint. I can expand it by clicking here. You will see here the request headers. These are not interesting. But also the request body. So let's click here on the request body. This will open up an additional window here inside the console. And you will be able to see the request body that we have sent. The Postman console is particularly useful for debugging when something goes wrong. When you don't understand what's going on, always come back to the Postman console and take a look at the request. See what happened there. You'll see here the book ID is one. This is the customer name that we have sent. So this has been randomly generated by Postman. If you don't need it anymore, the first X here is for closing the request body and the other one is for closing the console. That's it. I want to take a short break now from Postman. And so far in the course, you have seen many ways on how to use Postman. But in this session, I wanted to get a bit into how not to use Postman. So just to make clear, you have seen that we have used Postman to interact with APIs. Postman is not a tool for dealing with user interaction. Think about if you have a website with a form or buttons and you need a tool to click through those. Postman is not a tool that deals with such things. It's just working with APIs. Postman is also not a tool for doing any performance testing or any kind of tests where you need to send a lot of requests in a very short time frame. And also, Postman is not designed for security testing. You can use it for security testing, but this is not the primary focus of the tool. There are many other tools out there which I think do a much better job at helping you test to see if an API is really secure. So I hope this short lesson has helped you understand if Postman is the right tool for what you're trying to do. We have already submitted a few orders, so maybe now it's time to take a look at how many orders we have. In order to take a look at that, again, we have to look at the API documentation to see if there's anything that can help us in this regard. See here right below submit an order, there's also this get all orders endpoint, which is essentially the same endpoint slash orders, but this time we only have a get request. We're not trying to create an order, we're just getting an order. We're getting essentially all the orders that we have. So let's go back in Postman. And we're going to be lazy again and simply duplicate this request. Get all book orders will be the name of our request. Because we've duplicated this, we also have the authorization header with us. So this request again requires authorization. And instead of post, we're going to simply select get. And luckily, if we're looking here inside each order, we'll see a list of all the orders that we have. Each order has an order ID, which you can see here. It's no longer a number, it's a string. It says here which book we have ordered, who's the customer name, also the quantity and such information. And these other orders have been created using this random full name functionality that we have found from Postman. And this has ensured that we can now have different names that we're sending. So essentially, these are all the orders that we have. In this assignment, I'm asking you to take one of these existing orders and to view it individually. So instead of viewing all the orders, take one order ID and find out if there's an endpoint that allows you to view a single order ID. Give you a few seconds to pause the video and after that, I'll show you how it solved this. All right, so let's jump back into the API documentation and see what we can do. You will see here we have an endpoint, get an order, and the structure of this endpoint is pretty similar to the one where we were trying to get an individual book. So just gonna go ahead and copy this. Go back in Postman, 
duplicate one of the requests that we have and I'm going to replace here orders with this endpoint. Make sure there are no spaces or anything like this because this will break and Postman will send this request to the wrong endpoint. I'm going to simply rename this to get an order. And additionally, we need to specify this order ID. So if I'm just sending this as it is right now, essentially Postman will not send anything. So we will send the request to the order send point. So you will see all the orders, just in case you're wondering what happened there. And uh, if I type in some value that doesn't exist, I will get back a 404 not found. So I need to get a real order. So the real order, let's say, would be this one for John. I'm going to paste here the order ID exactly as it was in the other request. And now we will see an individual order that you're getting here. So that's it. You know, if I'm looking at this order right now, I'm not really happy with the customer name, John. It's not a full name. So how can we change this? Now, if we go back and use the post request once again to order book, we'll essentially create two orders. So I was wondering if there's any way how we can update this. And luckily there is. So here at the API documentation, we'll notice this endpoint which says update an order and it will use the HTTP request method patch to update this existing order and to require authentication and it only allows us to update the customer name. Depending on the API, you could update the entire order itself or only some specific properties. Depends from API to API. And again, here we're going to get an example on how to do this. So let's try to update this order. I'm going to simply copy here this customer name. And essentially the structure is the same as the one with getting an order. So for that reason, I'm going to duplicate this, rename it so that I can easily identify it. And for some reason, the parameter here got lost. Maybe I forgot to save it here before creating it. Absolutely no worries. I can simply go ahead and copy this from here. So we'll have the exact same request. I'm going to try it again with get. I'm noticing that this is the order that we're trying to update. So I'm going to select here patch. And patch is again one of these HTTP methods that allows us to send a body. So I'm going to click here on body, I'm going to select raw, and again, we're sending JSON. I'm going to paste it here. So let's add here another value. And we can even use this postman random variable here. So let's say a random last name. This would be a good one. All right. So let's save it. Let's run it again. And we're not getting back any body. And this is totally fine because the status will be indicated through the HTTP response status. And this is 204. Again, 204 indicates that everything was okay. So if we're trying to get that order again, you will see here now the customer name is John Anderson. And we have managed to update the same order. So the order ID remained the same. The book that we're ordering remained the same. The only thing that changed is the customer name. Now let's assume that we already have too many orders here and that we are trying to, you know, delete some of them. With patch itself, we can just update information, but we need a way now to delete this order. Let's say we already wanted to test something, but we no longer need it. So going back to the API documentation, you can notice that there's also an endpoint for deleting an order. Essentially, the path for all these operations from getting an order, updating an order, or deleting an order remained the same. The only thing that changed was the HTTP request method. We had used get, we had used patch, we had used post to 
create an order and now we are using delete so delete doesn't require anybody we just have to specify in this case which one is the order id again what we're using here is just an example and it's always important that you study the api documentation of the api that you are trying to use just because a respective endpoint works in one way with one of the HTTP methods for this API doesn't mean that all APIs work exactly the same. So to update an order, I'm going to simply go ahead here, click here on duplicate. I'm going to call it delete order. And I have to select the correct HTTP method. This one is delete. The order ID is already pre-filled here. So all I have to do, click on send. I'm going to get here 204 now content. But if we're still unsure if this worked properly, we can go back to get an order. So if we're trying to get the same order that we have deleted, you notice it's no longer here. And especially if we try to look at all the orders that we have, you will see now we have one order less. So obviously the delete order worked properly. Let's save this as well. And it will also show up correctly here in the collection. You can notice that we already have quite a few tabs open. So let's go ahead and close them. So what you can do is simply close all tabs. And if there are any unsafe changes, you'll have the possibility of saving those changes. If you have a lot of tabs and you don't need them anymore because they only contain temporary data, you can simply click here on the three dots and select force close all tabs and you will not be asked. Welcome to the second part of the course where we start laying the foundations for automating the testing of this API. As you have seen so far, we started working with the API, but there's still a lot of manual work involved. If someone changes the API, we have to retest everything manually and this is not very fun and also time consuming. Instead of verifying the API with our own eyes, we want to let Postman do this for us by writing API tests. We also want to avoid any manual intervention, like copy pasting data from one request to the other. Automation means that we let Postman do the work and we only step in if something goes wrong. By the end of the course, you will know how to test this API with just one command or only one click. This is the most exciting part of the course, so let's get started. All right, so let's get started with writing API tests. So far, we have manually tested this API and we went through all these requests and essentially we created sort of like a workflow. We First of all, checked if the API status is correct and we got a list of books. We looked at a single book. We ordered that book. We took a look at all the orders. We got an individual order. We updated that order and then finally we deleted it. And of course, for some of these operations, we also needed to register ourselves with this API. The way we have looked at this is take, for example, this API status. Well, Essentially, for Postman, as long as the request has been sent and something is coming back, this has been a successful request-response interaction. Postman has no idea, unless we tell Postman to, if this was successful or not. And we tell this by inspecting the response. We typically are looking at the response. We're not looking so much at the request because we already know the request. Look at the response and we're looking at, for example, the status code. And we're seeing here 200. And we're looking here at the body and we're seeing status OK. So instead of us manually looking at this information, let's tell Postman to do this for us. And in order to do that, we're going to switch here to this part of the request where it says here tests. And this is where we can write tests. What you can write in this window here is programming code, it's JavaScript, if you want to be very specific about it. Luckily, if you're not really into programming or you're just getting started with it, don't worry. I will try to make things as easy as it gets. 
Postman here has this window with this so-called code snippet. They essentially allow you to quickly do a few things with JavaScript without writing a lot of code. And especially for us as beginners right now, that's totally fine. The most simple test that we can write is to test that the status code is 200. So if we scroll here the snippets, you should be able to identify one of the snippets which says here status code, code is 200. And if you click on it, this code will be generated. Now, if for some reason the snippets have changed or you cannot find it anymore, don't worry. You simply can go ahead and type it as you see it here. Now, this is a piece of code that will be executed when the response has arrived and Postman will check if the status is 200. And you can even see here from the assertion that we're writing here, it's kind of like easy to understand. It says here pm.response dot to have status 200. So it's relatively easy to read. So again, you know what's happening here and also Postman knows what's happening here. So let's submit this. And now if we were paying attention here in the test results, it will say one from one. And if you click on it, you will see here a pass back in green it says status is 200. Whenever we are writing tests, we always must ensure that it will also fail. Just in case we made any mistakes when typing this code here, it's totally possible, may break this test or may always show that it's working when it sometimes is not working. So let's try and fail this test. We can fail this test by entering here an address that doesn't exist. So for example, if I write here status slash foo and simulate that API will send me something else back, I can get this test to fail. And you will see here, we expect the status code to be 200, but we're getting this assertion error. Expected response to have status 200, but got 404. As you see here, 404. I'm gonna fix it back. But this was just a small test to indicate that what we have written here is working properly. All right. Now, if the status code is, let's say, good, but not enough for our use case, we may also want to take a look at the response body. For most APIs, the response body will be written in JSON. This is just a very simple way to send data from the API to Postman or to any, let's say, programming language and to transform it and use it there. Essentially, the data that is coming back is relatively easy to use and understand by other programming languages. So let's try and write a test that will verify that the status is indeed okay. Now, the first step that we need to do is to parse the response. And people generally wonder when they hear about parsing, is like, why do we need to parse it? And the reason for that is what you see here, this is JSON, but this is essentially just text. It's not an object that we can use inside JavaScript. So for that reason, in JavaScript, what we will do is we're gonna define a variable. So const response will define a JavaScript variable and we're gonna initialize it equal. And this is something that comes from Postman. So I'm gonna write pm.response. This holds the response. And we are gonna call a function called JSON. And a function call in JavaScript is always like this. So inside this response variable in JavaScript, we will now have the response which will be parsed from JSON into a JavaScript object. If you want to take a look inside and see what is the value of response, we can go back to our old friend, the Postman console. By default, the Postman console will not record the values of different variables that are available unless instructed to. We can use, for example, console.log, which is again a function, and we'll specify in this function parameter, and that parameter is the response. So let's go ahead and open the console again. I'm gonna clear everything that you see inside here. Hit send one more time. And you will see here the request that has been sent. This is locked by default. 
And then you will see here from our console.log statement, you will see here this JavaScript object, which has been created from parsing the JSON response. The way this is represented looks pretty similar to JSON, but it is not JSON, it is a JavaScript object. All right, now let's say we're trying to get to this OK here. And we have here an object that has a property called status. Now in JavaScript, there are two ways on how we can get to that property. We can write response that status, and we can log that information. And you'll see here now it says OK. Or the alternative is to write this status between these square brackets as a string. And this is sometimes needed when dealing with names that contain, let's say, a hyphen or some other special characters, maybe a space or something like that, that will break the syntax. So this is another way to use it, but most commonly I would see it in this way. Both of them were got back with OK. Now we have accomplished a very important thing, and that is getting to the data that we are trying to test. If we cannot read it, if we don't have it in our console after using it with console log, there's no point in writing a test yet. So especially if you're still a bit confused about JSON and JavaScript and parsing and everything, make sure first that you see what you're trying to test inside console log. All right, so now we already have it there. We know that it exists. So let's write another test. A test in Postman always starts with pm.test. And pm.test is a function that takes two parameters. So you can see here pm.test, this is a function. The first parameter will be the name of the test. So let's say here status should be OK. It's totally up to you what to write inside here. And the second parameter, this is a bit more tricky. We have to specify the second parameter after a comma. And this will be a so-called callback function. And this has a syntax like this one. Or it can start like function this one. These two syntaxes are compatible with one another. This one here is a bit more modern. Now I'm going to hit here enter. And this is where we can start writing our assertions. By default, if we leave this test empty, it will not do anything. It doesn't really matter what we have here for a name. It will show it here as passed, even though we have no assertions. Now we're going to start with something very simple. And what we're going to do here is write something like pm.expect. And we can expect, for example, 1 dot 2 eql to equal 1. You have to be very careful when you're writing the syntax, and it has to look exactly like I have it here. Let's hit send again. If I'm saying expected one to equal two, we expect this to fail. It will say here, assertion error, expected one to deeply equal two. Don't worry about this deeply equal. Essentially, it's failing and it's telling that one doesn't equal two. All right. Now, how can we make this assertion that status is OK. We already know that this object here with this property contains OK. So let's check if it contains OK. So instead of this expect hardcoded value 1, I'm going to paste it here. And here between double quotes, I'm going to write OK. So let's send it again. We'll see that it passes. And if I write something else, for example, not OK, it will fail and it will say expected OK to deeply equal not OK. So this is an additional test that we have written on top of checking that the status is 200. If for some reason where, again, let's call here the foo status slash foo endpoint that doesn't exist, we expect some things to happen. So first of all, we'll get here 404 not found. Also here, this entire code that we have here will also fail because we're no longer getting JSON. This is not parsable, so it will fail altogether. 
But this is just a very simple way on how you can ensure that this simple endpoint is working properly. It is now time for another assignment. Based on what you have learned in the previous lesson, I want you to write a status code test for all the requests inside the collection. And I also want you to make sure that those tests will fail if needed. I'm going to give you a few seconds to pause this video. And after that, I will show you how I will create this. All right. So there's nothing preventing us from getting started with what we already have. I'm just going to change here a bit the syntax, make it a bit more modern. But as I mentioned before, this is absolutely equivalent and shouldn't make any difference. I'm going to copy this and let's take it here to the list of books. Click here on tests, gonna paste it. And again, the status that I'm getting is 200. I'm seeing here the test results are working. If I'm trying something else, let's say books, it will fail with a 404. So this is perfectly fine. Getting a single book, again, pasting absolutely the same test. And I will be absolutely sure that this will fail as well. Okay, order book. Now, this is interesting. Let's see what happens if we simply paste this test here. And you will see here that the status that we're getting is 201 created, that the test will fail. We can adapt this here to check for the status 201 and also makes sense to adapt the test name. This is of course not necessary, but it's just a good thing to keep it consistent. All right, so this one is now passing as well. These other ones are absolutely the same and I'm not gonna waste a lot of time making sure that they work as they will always return here to 100. All right, this is another interesting one. Trying to here to get an order and that order doesn't exist anymore. So we're getting 404 not found and also our test is failing. So this is a good thing that this has happened. We can look back here at the order book result. We can get one of these order IDs, put it here in the parameters, and running here the test. We'll see that the status is 200. So this has worked. We have to do the same for the next one where we are patching it. Sorry if I'm switching between too many tabs here. I'm now inside a patch request, pasting the test. I should have gotten a 204 and I'm expecting for a 200. So I'm going to change here 200 in 204. And now this one is passing as well. Deleting an order is pretty similar. I'm going to first let it fail. I'm getting here a 404 not found. I should also get a 204. Getting now the right order ID and putting it inside a parameter. Okay, another test that is passing. And also this with the registration of the API client. I have to identify the right test. And I'm going to paste it here as well. If I recall correctly, because we are creating something, we expect here to get to one. Obviously, for saying the same data again, this will not work. But now we have a simple test that tests that each individual request in this collection returns back the status code. And as you have already seen, this is already a pretty important test. This already gives us a pretty good idea if that request was successful or not. As you have noticed in the previous assignment, one thing is particularly annoying, and that is copy pasting this order ID from one request to the other. Essentially, we start here after we have this order book, we're getting an order ID. And after that, if we want to go through all the other requests, we have to paste it over and over again. And 
to be honest, we don't like that very much. Now, I mentioned in the beginning of the course that Postman has different variable scopes. And essentially, those variable scopes are collection variables that you have seen so far. There are also global variables, which is a variable type that is available inside the entire workspace for all collections, not just for a specific collection. Or there are also environments. Environments, they are useful if you have different environments. So for example, if you're developing software and you have a local development environment, local host, you have a testing development environment, and you have a production development environment, then you can define multiple environments and you can easily switch within them. And having here, for example, the base URL, you can easily swap that with a testing environment or a production environment or localhost. Getting a bit off topic right now in terms of this, the problem that we're trying to solve is to use a Postman variable to store this order ID. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to copy the value and I'm going to click here on this I icon right here in the corner. And what we're going to do here is to define a global variable. Just as well, we could have defined this inside our collection as a collection variable. But to be honest, this is sort of like a transactional data. We don't really want to save it inside a collection. We can just, you know, throw it in these global variables and not worry so much about it. So I'm going to click here on this edit. I'm going to define here the variable key, which is order ID. Of course, you can call it as you wish. I don't really care about the initial value. I'm just going to paste here the current value. The current value is now this one. Now, next time when we create this request, we can take this order ID. Again, if you lost it here, you can simply click here on this I. You'll see here the values. And you can even click here on the current value and easily change it. Make sure you don't add any spaces or new lines where you're pasting data. So now, at the next request, the get all book orders, there's nothing that we need to change. But then when we have here get an order, instead of manually specifying this parameter here, I'm gonna use here double curly braces, order ID. And you'll notice that this is the order ID that we have just saved. So I will even copy this variable here. Go to the next request, replace this as well. Go to the delete order, replace this here as well. So next time when we're clicking here on orders, let's see going to happen. So we're going to get a new value. Let's get here a new value. Again, click on the environment, replace it here. If I'm trying to get an order, I will see that order and it should be exactly the same. So we can cross check what we have here for a variable to what we're getting back in the response. I can update that order. I can go back and look at the updated information. And of course, I can go ahead and delete that order. And if I'm trying to get it again, it will not be there anymore. And as you have noticed, the Postman tests have been executed in the background and they already give us an idea if everything went okay or not. So we don't even have to look at the response body or anything like that. In this case, we went outside of what was expected in terms of the flow. But the rest of the tests were useful. And now we have managed to reduce a bit the amount of manual labor that we have to do in order to test this out. If you look back at the collection, we'll notice that we still have a few requests that contain some, let's say, hard-coded data. And it all starts with this list of books where we have looked at some of these books. We have identified a book ID and we have used that book ID in some of the upcoming requests. For example, get a single book. We have here an ID that is hard-coded. And of course, 
Then the next request with ordering the book, we have again the ID here. So this kind of like hard-coded data makes our tests and our entire collection a bit susceptible to changes. For example, if that book is being removed, then having like this hard-coded value there will not do us any good. So for that reason, we have to find a way to make everything a bit more dynamic. So looking at this list of books, let's say, for example, we want to get the first nonfiction book that we can find here. So as you already remember, essentially, we can add here a filter. So we can add here the filter type and say we're looking for a nonfiction book. So we can change that here. And for sending this again, we'll only get nonfiction books. So let's try again to set this to a variable and see what happens. The question is like, how can we get this information? Previously, we have manually set this variable, but we still we want to avoid getting this. We want to set this variable automatically. And this is totally possible. So let's go here to the scripting part where we have the tests and we also have here the response. So let's imagine that we want to get to this ID here, ID2. First of all, we're gonna define a new variable called response. And we're gonna do the parsing. So pm.response.json will parse the response JSON into a JavaScript object. Open up again the console, send a request, and we'll see here the data that we have. This data format is different than what we had before because it is a list of books, or how is it called in JavaScript? It's an array. An array contains multiple objects. So this book with ID2, this is an object. Then there is the next object with the other book with ID5. If we try inside the console log to do something like response.id, you'll see here that it says undefined. And the reason for that is because we first have this array. So we need to get that data from the array first. And then we have an object where we can call the property ID. The array that we have has keys. Essentially, a way that allows us to access that information. For example, if I write here a square bracket and I say zero, this will get us the first element from the array. Computer science, we always count from zero. So this is why the first element has the key zero. Let me demonstrate this. You will see here we get this too. Now, the problem here is that this first book is not available. So what we have to do is to get the second book. And the second book will have the key one. Trying to get that. And we'll get ID number five here. That's all good. The problem is if this data set changes, or for example, the first one will become available or the second one will become unavailable. Having this hard-coded data here will kind of like cause us some issues. For example, even if something changes in the parameters, we're no longer setting this nonfiction filter here. The ID that we can get if we keep it hard-coded like this will be different all the time. And we don't want this. This will be too risky. So we have to look into a different way of handling this. Because this is an array, we can use a specific function that this array has. So we can define here a new constant. Let's call it, for example, non-fiction books. And we can get a response. I'm going to use the method filter. And inside here, we can define a condition. Now the condition that we're gonna define here is inside another function, 
where we will receive a parameter book. And then with this book, we can define a condition. So for example, book dot available. And we can decide here if available should be true. From the two books that we have here, we can notice that the first one is not available, but the second one will be available. And let's just assume all the time we'll know that we'll get one of these books. So now what we can do is from this nonfiction books, we can get the first element that we get because we will know that this will be available. Filter will throw out any books that are not available and will only give us the books that are available. And then by specifying nonfiction books zero, we will essentially get the first book that is available and that is a nonfiction book. And you will see it here being locked. In this way, we have managed to get to this property that is really hidden inside the response without actually having to write something hard coded with the only assumption that all the time we should find at least one nonfiction book that is available. For most APIs, this is an assumption that's quite valid. The criteria that you use here totally depends up to you. You can search for a specific name or by any other characteristic. If you find yourself in a situation when you need to filter a list of different objects and extract only one. Now, so far, this hasn't helped us a lot. So what we want to do next is to also actually set that variable. Luckily, Postman has another code snippet that we can use. And the code snippet is called set a global variable. So I'm going to click on it. It will be generated here. And all we have to do here is to specify the following. We'll specify here the book ID. This is the name of the variable. You can call it as you wish. And then we also have to specify the value. And when you're specifying the value, you want to make sure that you're not putting anything between quotes because this will be a string. But since we have here a JavaScript object, we will be putting that. Now, of course, we don't want to have the object itself. We want to get only a property of that object. So I'm going to write here dot ID. So we're getting this object and we know that the property ID is five. After sending this, you can click on this eye icon here and you will see pretty similar to the other variable that we have manually set that now book ID has value five. So it means that now we can get an updated book ID with our requests and we don't have to do anything else. Now, just in case something does happen and no book is being found, it kind of makes sense to test. So just in case we don't have any books, there is a Postman test that will let us know, hey, we couldn't find any nonfiction books. And in this case, we're not going to be directly asserting the response, but kind of like indirectly through this filter that we have. So let me show you what I mean by that. Let's go ahead and write a new test, pm.test. And let's say here, book found. This is the name of the test. This will be the callback function. And inside, let's try to write an assertion. Instead of logging this, I'm going to define a variable called book. And I'm going to write a few expectations. So I'm going to use pm.expect. I'm going to expect book to be an object. So first of all, we're expecting that book is an object. And additionally, we can write other assertions. For example, pm.expect book.available to be true. And this is absolutely the same as writing pm.expect book.available to equal 
true. It's just a different way of writing it. So again, this just ensures that everything is as we expect it to be. Here, what we're setting here, instead of using this, we can use this book.id. And we can also try to make this fail. Now, it may fail in a different way. We can write here, for example, instead of equals true, we can set a filter that will never exist. And we're going to get here, actually, first of all, a type error because we're trying to get property ID of something that's undefined. Essentially, Postman will anyway warn us that something didn't went well. But this additional test that we can write are just good place to ensure that we document how the API should behave and we document what we expect to get back. So I'm going to fix this and let everything run properly. So for example, just to ensure that everything works properly, we can also surround this by something like, let's say, if book, only then we're setting this global variable. So let's make this fail again. And then we'll see here that we don't get this error anymore from JavaScript, which says here book found has failed. So it hasn't found a book. And then we're making the expectation undefined to be an object. So this is a way to get around that JavaScript error that we have seen previously. But apart from that, this is how we ensure that what we have written here in terms of JavaScript is being properly handled just in case something unexpected happens. And now it's time for another short assignment for you. We have identified here a book and we have seen that it is available. I want you to give you the opportunity to write an expectation on your own. And I want you to expect that this book is from the type nonfiction. Even if we have used this parameter here and we specify that it's nonfiction, just wanted to test it again and also try to make it fail. I'll give you a few seconds to pause the video and to do the assignment on your own. And after that, I will show you how I would solve it. All right, this is pretty easy. I'm going to simply duplicate the last expectation that we have here because from the structure is already the way it should be. And I'm going to change here a property from available to type. And the type that we're interested in is nonfiction. So let's fix this error here from above in true. And we have tests that are passing. Let's disable the type. And maybe we can even change it to fiction. But essentially, the first available book that we found was a fiction book. So for that reason, the test is failing. So now we have ensured that whatever we're getting back is indeed a non-fiction book because this was the original requirement. And after one assignment, what is better than doing another assignment? Because practice really matters. Now, this assignment will have two points. The first of it is I want you to use this variable book ID that we have saved here. And you've seen that it has been properly saved as a global variable. I want you to use it in a get single book and also in order book. This is in the request body. And this is here as a parameter. Since you're already looking at a get single book request, how about checking again if inside here, so let's write for example five. I'd like to check that the current stock is actually greater than zero. And I'm going to give you a small hint on how to do this. So I'm going to go ahead here to simply copy the structure of the test here. Let's say I'm going to write the is in stock. So this would be the name of the test. And the expectation would be pm.expect. 
one to be above two. A very simple expectation here that will help you out when asserting that the current stock is greater than zero. And you will see here that one is not above two, so it's not working. I'll give you a few seconds to pause this. And after that, I will continue solving the assignment. All right. So the first part of the assignment is super, super easy. We only have to replace here any hard-coded values with what we have here, book ID as a global variable. And you can see it's being rendered. And we also have this order book. And inside here is again, super simple. We only have to get that right. And we can test if it's working properly. We're getting no errors, so all good there. Going back to the test that we wanted to check here, the property that we want to use is this current stock. So as you recall, first of all, we have to parse the response. So we define a variable called response and we're using pm.response. Dot JSON. We're parsing that. And what we can do here is to expect that response dot current stock to be above zero. Super simple. The problem that you're getting here is you're going to get this weird error. It says stock is not defined. And you'll probably not understand what is this referring to. The problem is this dot syntax, this dot notation, when getting properties from an object, works with this kind of like simple properties that are one word. When you have this dash here, this hyphen here, this would kind of like break the syntax and you have to fall back to the other syntax with square brackets. So we adding here this square bracket, we're putting it the name of the property as a string here it can be single quotes or double quotes, use as you wish. And that will get us the right property and we'll see here now it is in stock. If we're trying to get something that's not in stock, so for example, book ID 2, I think it was not in stock. We'll have here a failing test, expected zero to be above zero, so that's not working. But with our book ID here, it's working properly. All right, so this was the assignment. Now it seems that we have all elements that can help us do proper test automation. We have written API tests that ensure the API response as we expect the API to respond and generally how we expect the API to work. And we also have added all these variables and essentially we don't have to copy paste anything anymore from one request to the next one. The next step is to move into the direction of automation. We want to take this request and instead of going request by request from one request to the other and running this manually, we will use a built-in tool from Postman. This is the collection runner. And the collection runner allows us to execute the entire collection with just one click. So let's see how this works. First of all, I have too many requests here open again. So I'm gonna simply go ahead and close all of them. I don't need them, everything is saved. And here in the lower part of the screen, it's a bit hidden, you will find this button runner. So I'm gonna click on it. In earlier Postman versions, you could start the runner directly from the context menu of the collection itself. Not sure if this will be added back, but just in case, if you're watching this a bit later on, maybe this has come back here in the collection, just saying. All right, so this is essentially the runner. And in order to run this collection, we're gonna essentially drag and drop it here. And here is the run order. The run order is in which order will this request be executed. Now, for example, here, 
the way we have organized the requests here in the collection, this is how they will be executed. For example, here, the way we did it is before actually ordering a book, we first registered our API client. So it may make sense to do this somewhere before that. Of course, it's not impacted. So if we don't want this anymore, we can simply close this all together. Open the collection runner again, drag it here. And you will see the new order. You also have the possibility of reordering requests or disabling some requests that you don't need. Okay, so this is in terms of in which order will this request be executed. There are some other things that we want to do. One very important one is to save the responses. And just in case something goes wrong, by saving the responses, we'll be able to take a look at what has happened. Okay, so let's click on this button and let the runner do his job. Now, as you can notice, some of the requests have been successful in terms of testing and some of them have failed. For example, here, register API client, this has failed and we already knew that sending the same data will cause this to fail. So no big surprise there. There are also some other ones who have failed here. For example, get an order has failed. Now, if you want to better understand what has happened, we can take a look here. And if we're looking here at the request, we'll see that we have this order. And let's try to understand like what has happened here. You'll notice here that we have this order ID, but this is the order ID that we have manually hard-coded here. We are not updating this with every execution. And yeah, this is your next assignment. Do you have any idea how we can fix this? I will we'll give you a few seconds to pause this video and to try to do this assignment on your own. All right. Obviously, manually hard coding this, it's not the best approach. And as you can see, we totally forgot that this thing was manually added. So what we have to do here is to fix this order. So where is this coming from? It's coming from this post request order book. And we have added a test, but we're not doing anything else. So let's submit it again. This is the property that we're interested in. If we want to be very sure that this is working properly, we can use again console.log. But just gonna speed it up a bit. So again, we're parsing the response. I have to do this all the time. And it's not pm.request.json, it's pm.response. I have to be careful what I'm writing. And we're gonna set the global variable. And we're gonna be careful to name it order ID. So this is the key. This is how the name of the variable will be. And we're going to get it from response dot order ID. You see, I'm always copy pasting this because I don't want to make any mistakes in terms of how I name this. Let's run it again. We inspect it. And what do we see here? It is absolutely the same order ID as we have in the response. So it means this has been updated. And let's go back to our execution and see if this helps us get rid of the error. I'm gonna click here on run again. And now you can see that apart from the register API client, which has failed, the rest of them are working properly. And we have at least a status code test that is ensuring that everything is working properly. So, good job. There is still something very annoying about this register API client request. On one hand, we don't want to get rid of it because we may need it later on. But at the same time, when we're automating now the execution, it's kind of annoying to have it in there. And luckily, there is a way how we can influence the order in which the requests are executed. And let me give you an example. I'm going to go here to this API status request. I'm going to go to the tests. And what Postman allows us to do 
is to specify here in the code where Postman should go with the next request. And currently this is done by writing Postman. This is instead of PM, which is, let's say, the newer way on how we're interacting with Postman. This Postman entirely is a bit older and may get replaced later on, maybe at the time you're watching this. Currently in the version that I'm using is still working, just saying. But it allows us to specify where the next request should go. And this goes by saying set next request. You will see here the autocomplete. And here we will not specify a new URL, but it will specify the name of the request. So for example here, how about skipping this? So the normal execution goes from here to here to here to here. How about if we tell Postman, hey, after you've checked the API status, go to the list of books. So we have to get here the name of this request exactly as it is. So I'm going to simply copy the name and put it here as a string. So going back to the collection runner, I'm going to hit here this one. And if you look here, you will see we had API status. We have, you know, registered the API client. No, it's no longer there. We have jumped directly to the list of books. And, you know, the flow continued. We didn't want to skip any other requests. And you can see here that the register API client is not present. An alternative to doing this is to move this right here at the end. And for example, you can go to this delete order request and specify Postman, set next request. And this time we don't want to go anywhere else. We just want to say stop. So in order to say stop, we simply say specify null. Null means don't go anywhere else. Don't go here, for example. Gonna write again. This one with the API status has absolutely no effect. It will go to the list of books, just as instructed, but this is also the normal behavior. What has changed here is that the delete order request will be essentially the last request because it will instruct Postman, hey, stop the loop. Now, the thing with these loops is, well, it can get crazy, so you have to be very careful when you're using these conditions and especially when you want to stop something. If you just want to skip something, that's totally fine. But I'm just going to demonstrate what's happening if I'm going to set it to list of books. So it's running and running and running. So it will essentially run forever because we don't have any condition that's telling it to stop. It will continue running endlessly. So I'm gonna manually stop it here. But especially if you wanna do automation, it's probably not a good idea to have a job running all the time. So just be very careful with the conditions that you're writing and use the collection runner to test it out before you do anything else. So we have managed to automate this with a collection runner. We still need to do this manual click there. And how about a way to run this collection all the time, but not to worry about doing that click. And there is a functionality that is built in Postman, and that is the monitors. You can notice here from collections a bit further down, you have monitors, but also from the context menu of the collection, you can select here monitor collection. So monitor collection or clicking here on monitors and clicking on create a monitor will take you to this page. So let's see here, the monitor name will be check books API. Say for example, we want to make sure that this books API is working all the time without us having Postman open or without starting the collection runner. And we can define a frequency. So for example, we can decide to run it every day. 
right, every weekday and so on. So there are a lot of configurations that we can select here and I will not get into all of them. Of course, what's important here, if you go this way, you have also to select the collection, kind of important. So we're using this simple book API, the only collection available in this workspace. I'm gonna go ahead here, click on create. And once this monitor has been created, you don't need to do anything else. It will start on its own and you will get a notification by email, something went bad. Of course, just for testing purposes, I will run it manually once, but if you don't run it manually, it will start on its own according to the schedule. This execution will happen on the Postman infrastructure and is totally decoupled from your browser, your computer, or anything else. It is a relatively easy way to check if something is working. In this case, you will see here that it says unhealthy, something went bad. So we can scroll a bit down here and we'll see this report and it will show us what has happened. And you will see here that the test that we had here, the first request that we have, they are working. But as soon as we do something with orders, it will not work anymore. The test will fail and it will say here 401 unauthorized. So what's going on? There are not so many information in regards to this. And you'll kind of have to guess like what has happened. As you remember, at one point we have created inside our collection this token, which we have manually generated, and we haven't specified it in the initial value. Now, when we have created this monitor, essentially we have shared this collection with Postman. And because we haven't provided the access token, they don't know what they should do. So this is why this will fail. So if we go ahead and add the current value to the initial value, save it, go back to the monitor and run it again, you will see now that it has worked perfectly. Unfortunately, when something doesn't work well here, it's a bit harder to debug because you don't have access to all the information that you would normally have inside Postman. But especially when everything works properly, it's still a pretty powerful tool. Now, typically when anything fails around automation or with a collection runner or here with a Postman monitor, it is typically regarding missing Postman variables or something that hasn't been properly set. So it's always a good idea to check that first. The most important tool when trying to automate a collection run is Newman. And Newman is a CLI tool that can take a Postman collection, run all the tests, and at the end also generate a report. If you know how to use Newman, you can run a Postman collection with API tests on any professional server that deals with building and testing software, like for example, Jenkins, GitLab CI, Team City, or anything else that you use. We're not gonna look into specific integrations, but I wanted to show you how we can properly use Newman. In order to use Newman locally on your computer, you need to have Node.js installed, and I've added some details on how to do that inside the course notes. I've opened here a terminal and I already have Newman installed. So I'm gonna write here Newman, dash dash version. And this will indicate that Newman has been properly installed on my computer. Now you're probably wondering, how can we get access to the Postman collection that we have and run it with Newman? And that is definitely a very good question. First of all, you can go to your collection, click on these three dots, and export this collection as a JSON file. I've created a new folder to hold this collection, and I'm gonna simplify a bit the name. So it's gonna be postman underscore collection dot JSON. I'm gonna go ahead and save it. An alternative way to doing this 
is simply clicking here on the context menu of the collection, clicking on share collection, getting a public link, and this public link will be generated. You need to pay attention that this link does not automatically get updated when you update something inside your collection. And every time you make a change and use this public link, you have to come back here and click on update link to make those changes visible. There's also a third way, which I'm not gonna show, by using a Postman API. So Postman also has an API that allows you to get to these collections by using an API key. That I will add in the course notes some details about it. So there are three ways on how we can do it. And I'll be demonstrating two of those. So from the terminal window that I have, I'm gonna go inside the folder where I have saved this collection. This is a simple book API. And you will see here that the Postman collection is here. So I can simply use Newman, run, and then I'm gonna specify the path to the collection. Now you can notice that the entire execution has been successful. All the tests have been generated properly. And everything seems to be working fine. The alternative to do using it as a file is something like Newman run, and specifying here the link where the collection is. This can be essentially anywhere where it's reachable over HTTP. I'm gonna simply copy the link that we have here as a public link. And absolutely the same thing will happen. The reason why this may fail is again due to variables or missing tokens that you may have in your collection, which either are not set as the initial value or are only available as a global variable or something that hasn't been exported. If you're using, for example, environment, you need to export those environments as well and also specify them here. Probably one of the most important things when working with Newman is the possibility of generating reports. And one of the reports everyone in the Postman community absolutely loves is the HTML extra report, which will generate an HTML report. Now, it is not only nice to have a good looking report, but it's also super helpful when you're trying to debug something that went wrong. This report will contain anything that you log, it will contain the full request and the full response, so really, really a lot of data. I'm gonna link you in the course notes also this reporter and how you can install it. And I'll also go through the installation steps and how to configure it in a bit. So this is the command that you need to run in order to install this reporter. I already have it here. And in terms of the usage, you can notice here that we have here Newman run, and it's the collection. And all we have to do is specify the reporter. We can use dash dash reporters, which is my preferred way of specifying any flags or any additional information to a command because it's just much easier to read. So this is the Newman run command. And I'm gonna write here reporters. We're gonna still keep the CLI reporter. This is the CLI reporter, what you're seeing here. And without any spaces, comma, I'm gonna write HTML reporter. And in writing these commands, it has to be exactly as it is. So it's not HTML report, it's HTML extra, sorry. But you have to write reporters space and then specify the reporters. It's not reporters equals or anything like this. So be very careful what you're writing. And also, as you've seen, I've written the wrong reporter name. So this has been executed and I will look inside the folder to see how this report looks like. So inside that folder, you will notice that an additional folder has been created. It's called Newman. And it contains here an HTML report that you can open by double clicking on it. And what you will see here is absolutely like an overview of what has happened in terms of requests and responses. Let's see how many requests have been sent. You can go to the requests. You can investigate what happened with each request. For example, order book, you can open it up. 
you can see that there's been a post request, you can see the address, you can see which request headers have been sent. So for example, if you're having like any problems with authorization, you will see here if the proper token was sent. If you see here, for example, a Postman variable that hasn't been resolved, it's probably one reason why something failed. So it really gives you a lot of information in a very nice and easy to read format. Both for Newman and for the HTML reporter, there are tons of configurations that you should know, or especially if you want to get started with this, you really have to get very familiar with the documentation, try to understand which flags are available, what you can configure, you can specify the names of the reports and many other things. We are coming towards the end of the course and I want you to give you the big picture in terms of automation and why Newman is so important and where does everything that you have learned fit. Here's a pretty realistic project that I have. This is an API and essentially this API has a build pipeline. This is a piece of software that goes through a build process. So this is where the code is being compiled. It has some internal tests that are being executed, unit tests, and also some code quality. Then this API is being deployed to a server. And then I have here a stage of doing API testing. So once I have deployed this API somewhere, I'm using a Postman collection in Human to run some tests and to ensure that the API is working properly. And just in case something is not working properly, I rely on the Postman test and on Newman to notify me and tell me inside this pipeline, hey, the last change that you have done caused some issues. There were some tests that failed. And this is where everything fits in together. So for example, if I go to this API testing stage here and I'm looking inside the job, well, what I will see here is a Newman execution. I have here Newman run. I'm running a collection. I'm also specifying some environments. So one environment here that I'm using. I'm also specifying reporters like a CLI reporter, HTML extra, JUnit. I'm specifying where I should save a specific reporter and so on. In addition to this, in addition to getting all this information here, you can go here to browse. And I will see here inside the Newman folder, I'll have the HTML reporter. And here I'll be able to debug if something went wrong, I'll be able to understand what has happened and so on. So this is essentially how everything comes in place. We have an API that we want to use and test and ensure that it's working properly. We have gone through the manual process of testing it, but once we are happy that the API works and we have understood how it works, we have documented that functionality by writing API tests. And we have taken this execution of the test through different stages. First of all, within Postman, just to make sure that everything works properly. But then we have used that collection and using Newman, we could essentially automate this execution run and integrate this Postman collections with many other tools. We're showing here the example with GitLab CI. You can do the same with Jenkins, with TeamCity, CircleCI, or any other continuous integration, continuous deployment server that you may be using. We have accomplished so many things in a very short amount of time. I know this was a lot to take in, but I hope it was useful and that this has opened your appetite for learning more. If the scripting part was difficult and you are still confused about JavaScript, variables, objects, arrays, you can benefit from taking a basic JavaScript programming course. Suppose you want to learn more about API testing and Postman. In that case, you can explore topics around data-driven tests, where you use an external CSV or JSON file to fit different data sets in your request, or schema validation, where you essentially test the structure of the response in one go instead of going property by property, or you can go deeper into authentication and learn about OAuth 2. You will find links to more advanced tutorials that show different things you can do with Postman in the course notes. I hope you have enjoyed this course and I'll be very happy to see you again. Bye now.